There we go. Hello and welcome to the Grad Alting Workshop Series. At today's workshop, we will address the topic of conflict resolution. Uh, my name is Debbie Mikutsky, and I am the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid. I use she, her pronouns. This workshop is brought to you by graduate student legal aid. And in case you don't know, um, legal aid services are something that you've already paid for because you've paid your graduate student fee. So we are here, we want to be busy, we want to be helping you with your legal issues. Um, so what does that look like? Because you might think, I don't need an attorney, um, but we do provide legal consultations on general matters. For example, if you are having a problem with your landlord and you just don't know what to do, get in touch with us, we will help you. Um, but certainly we, our attorney, his name is Zach Mundy, and he helps students with all kinds of legal issues. And if for some reason we can't help you, we will make a referral. So we provide legal consultations on immigration matters. And what does that look like? It means that once a month, we have an immigration attorney um, meet with students virtually and um, address immigration matters. Um, we also provide adv advocacy for students who are charged by the university. And I am a notary. Um, so that right now is our only in-person service. All of our other consultations are done virtually. So we are really accessible. And um, hopefully that helps out our busy graduate students. So before I introduce our speaker, I have a couple of announcements. Um, automatic closed captioning has been enabled for those who want to read along. Um, near the end of the workshop, I'm gonna post a link to our survey. We need to know how we're doing. So please let us know what you thought of this workshop. Um, we will email links to the survey, the slides and the recording um, this afternoon. Um, we will also post all the links on our website. And finally, I see that we've got someone I need to introduce um, before I get to our speaker. Um, her name is Simone Warwick Bell, and she is the graduate academic counselor for the graduate school. Welcome, Simone. Thanks for coming today. Um, Y'all need to know about Simone because she has a lot of experience in the areas of um, care coordination with mental health staff mental health case management, counseling. She is, her, her job is to advocate for um, uh, graduate students um, and marginalized group, but she is just a terrific resource within the graduate school. And Simone, I'm, I'm really glad you could be here today. Do you wanna say anything? Sure, I'm sorry to have my camera off. I'm home with my daughter. Um, yeah. Apologies. Hi, everyone. My name is Simone. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm happy to meet if you need any long-term mental health care or if you hear heard everything um, and you're like, hey, I need help finding a therapist. I'm always happy to talk. Or if you're considering taking a leave of absence, um, I am available to meet to help you in either of those areas. I'm going to drop my email into the chat. Um, and if there's anything I can do to support you as a graduate student, um, even if it is not in my wheelhouse, I will try to connect you to those resources so that you are supported and you are taking care of your mental health. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Simone. And, you know, if we ha have a student that comes to us that needs some help, we will refer them to Simone. Simone does the same. We all try to work together to support our graduate students. So. Let's get started with the topic of the day, which is conflict resolution. So I am so pleased to introduce a brand new speaker to the Grad Alting Workshop series. Her name is Erica Bridgeford. And Erica is the Director of Training for Community Mediation Maryland. And um, thank you so much, Erica, for being here today and for helping us learn how to address conflict with greater skill and hopefully more confidence, right? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have an update. I didn't realize we were uh, that, that it was it was 
old information still floating around. So I'm not the exec, I'm not the training director at Community Mediation Maryland anymore. I'm the executive director at the Baltimore Community Mediation Center. So I've come full circle. I started as a volunteer mediator at the Mediation Center in Baltimore, and then I became a trainer, and then became the trainer for the whole state. And now I'm back in Baltimore running the Mediation Center there. So I'm really excited to be with you all today. I'm also co-founder and co-organizer of Baltimore Ceasefire 365. So if you're wondering like, where do I know her from? You're not crazy. That's... <laughs> That's probably that maybe where you know me from. Um, so today in the hour that we have, we're going to start at self. So you can't give what you don't have. A lot of times we think about conflict as what's wrong with those other people and why don't they act better in conflicts and how, you know, give me some skills and concepts to help deal with those other people. And the truth of the matter, that you, it doesn't matter what's going on with other people if you aren't grounded inside of your own concepts and beliefs about conflict. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but first, I want to start with just some Zoom logistics. So if you're looking at your screen right now, what you see is only my face and a bunch of black boxes, which doesn't make for good community building. It doesn't make for really, you know, communal space for people to feel free to say the things that are popping up for them. So I'm gonna, we're gonna, we try to keep these trainings as much like being in person as possible. And when we're in a training space, we even set up the room in a way that builds community and, you know, for, nurtures and encourages conversation so that it's not just about the trainer talking at the group, but it is about an interactive experience that we all have together. And so for so when we're in person, we don't set up chairs in like rows of chairs. We set them up in a circle so that nobody's ever looking at the back of anybody else's head when they're talking and that sort of thing. So as that translates into Zoom world, <laughs> if you can turn your camera on, please do. I understand that, you know, we're all still kind of functioning in and out of pandemic ratchetness. So we don't always look our best. We look like we're working from home. We look like, you know, kids have spilled stuff on us and animals have jumped up on us. And, you know, so I get it. Um, and um, it is helpful if we can, like actually engage with each other's beings as much as possible and having our cameras on helps us to do that. Also, um, as you're listening, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions that you have. So if we were in person, I wouldn't start a training by asking for everyone's um, text, you know, phone numbers so that we could text each other any comments we had all throughout the training, right? We wouldn't be reading messages. We would be actually out loud saying what it is we wanted to say for everybody to have access to it. And so same thing here. So although there's a chat box, um, if you're actual, if there's something that you would like the whole group to think about, or you have a comment for the group, you have a comment or question for me, um, it is, I'm asking that you err on the side of unmuting and just saying it out loud instead of typing it in the chat. Um, and I will look at the chat um, ever so often to see if there's anything in there that people just weren't able to say um, out loud. But, uh, you know, so. Those are those. Um, we also have um, ways of really just encouraging one another as we're doing these workshops. And so if you hear things that people, and this is where it's helpful if your camera is on. Um, so if someone says something that you really, you agree with, or it really resonates with you, then you, you give them snaps. And so snaps is literally your snap, your fingers like, yes, me too, me too, right? That's what snaps are for. Um, now, yes, Zoom has its own reactions and things like that. And so um, if you are completely unable to turn your camera on and you need to do a you know, Zoom reaction, feel free to click a Zoom reaction as well. And then there are sometimes people say things that, you know, snaps is just not good enough. Like whatever it was they said, it like went straight to the center of your soul, your being, you're like, oh, right, okay. They get a sizzle. So if we were in person, you would actually touch the person and go, you know, like that. 
even if it meant you got up out of your chair, walked across the room and sizzled their knee or whatever it is that you got, <laughs> or their shoulder, whatever it is you got permission to touch in the age of consent. Um, but they get a sizzle. Okay, so now that we're on Zoom, you got a sizzle like, you know, like this. So you're putting your finger to the camera lens and going like that, right? And that let somebody know, you know, you're giving them a sizzle for whatever it was they just said up there. Okay. So if that stuff out of the way, we're going to do an, um, uh, an interactive activity to really look at what conflict looks like to you. Because how we view conflict, what we think about it, how we've been conditioned around it, then directly impacts the decisions we make in it, how we respond. And it, then it also colors what other people are doing in it. So all of our judgments about how people should or shouldn't be acting with us within the conflict, it's based in our beliefs about what conflict is in the first place, right? Um, and then all of that determines the kind of outcomes you're gonna have. So if you're thinking about the kind of outcomes you generally get, you know, and how conflicts generally turn out, you can probably, track it back to thoughts and beliefs you have about either that conflict specifically or conflict in general. So that's where we're, that's what we're going to talk about with the hour that we have today. And we're going to do it in a very interactive kind of way. So you're going to have to at least unmute yourself. I'm still begging for cameras to be yours. But if you can't do it, you'll at least have to unmute yourself to participate in this activity because we'll have to hear voices in order um, to get answers. So we're gonna do an activity called a brainstorm of conflict. And so what's happening is you see right now the Zoom whiteboard. And um, what, I, what, we're, what I'm gonna be, what I'm asking you all to do is to think about the last time you were in conflict with somebody. And so don't, I'm not asking about when it wasn't in really involving you, it was other people and you stepped in to help. Those aren't the ones I'm talking about because it's easy, you know, when it's not, when you don't have skin in the game. So I want you to really think about when you have been, the last time somebody got on your nerves, disagreed with you specifically, a value you hold dear felt violated, right? When you had conflict with somebody, I want you to put yourself back into it a little bit. Um, the last time or the last few times, if you're like me, you know, there's been a few conflicts that you can think back on, you know, in the last few months. So think about the last few conflicts you've had and think about what were all of the emotions that you felt the range even of emotions that you felt. Think about what kind of things were going on inside of your body. Think about the kinds of things you said. And then also think about the other personal people involved in the conflict, just given their behavior. What are some of the emotions you, you if you could, had to guess, <laughs> what are some of the emotions you think they were actually experiencing on the inside? What kind of stuff was going on in their body, right? So thinking about just, just thinking about conflict. What are the words, emotions, things, outcomes even that come to your mind? And what we're gonna do is gonna be popcorn style. So as you're saying things out loud to me, like, oh, this pops into my mind just thinking about conflict, right? As you're giving me those words, I'm gonna be typing those words on the screen. Um, and so it'll start giving us a picture of what conflict looks like to us. Okay, so popcorn style meaning pop when you're ready, unmute yourself, give me some words, what comes to your mind when you think about conflict? Frustration. Frustration, what else? Uncomfortable. You said uncomfortable? Yeah. What else? Oh, that was wrong. Angry. Angry, good. What else? Distress. Angry, distress, good. What else? Sometimes it feels pretty trivial. Trivial, that's a good one. Thank you, what else? Tears. Tears. Mm-hmm. 
What else comes to your mind just thinking about conflict? Perceived consequences. Mm -hmm. What else? Disbelief. Disbelief. Oh, and someone put in the chat, they can't unmute because they're at work, but they said okay. con condescending. Oh, that's a good one. Yes, it is. <laughs> And now you are attesting my ability to spell words correctly. Condes, let's see if this e -S -E -N -D -I -N -G. is. E-S-E-N-D-I-N-G. You got it. Right? Yeah. yeah. When we're in person, I generally just like put a little dot at the top of the chart paper. And I tell people, when you see me press this dot, it just auto corrects the entire page. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll just pretend like I can, when I do this. Oh, it just, you know, autocorrect the whole page if I make a mistake. What else comes to your mind just thinking about conflict? Miscommunication. Miscommunication. What kind of um, emotions? When you think about conflict, what kind of emotions do you experience? What kind of things go on in your body? Accelerated heart rate. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Marty says anger. Yeah, we got angry right here. Yeah, we do. Okay, so let's look at what we have so far, right? So we have these green words on the page. And this is so far, when you think about conflict, do I hear somebody trying to say something? One more came in, confused. Okay. Confused. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Okay. So, so far, when you, when you all think about conflict, the picture is frustration, perceived consequences, accelerated heart rate, uncomfortable tears, angry, disbelief, confused, miscommunication, distress, condescending, trivial. What do you notice about this list so far? Somebody unmute yourself and tell me if you had to describe this list to somebody, how would you describe it? It's mostly what kind of words? Mostly negative. Mostly negative. Let's give Steven some snaps. Very good for still being woke. So deep into the day, lunchtime and everything. And he's still popping, right? It's mostly negative words. So let's start right there. Before we think about what else conflict can be, evidently, we start at assuming that conflict is negative or else this would not be the picture that we had. I said, what does conflict look like to you? And you all gave me a swamp monster, right? This green swamp monster that it's mostly like, yeah, that's a pretty negative experience that we're gonna have, right? So that's the conversation we're gonna start with. Talk to me about, or talk to us about, why do you think that just thinking about conflict, we automatically assume that it's going to be something that it is negative. Why is it that we just view conflict as a negative, bad thing? Extor historical experience for some people. It, it's rare that I've experienced a conflict where there's been a positive resolve and outcome, but mm -hmm. it happens but it's a rarity and in certain instances, there is no resolve and the stakes are a little bit higher for grad students or even those in professional settings. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. So a few things in there. So if in your own, your own personal experience, right? The history of your experience is rare that conflict ever turns out in a way that you would call good. 
but more, more often than not, it's either turning out negative or you don't feel like it really got resolved or you didn't get your needs met at all, then if that's been your personal experience, absolutely, somebody says the word conflict, that's going to be mostly the experience that's right at the top of your mind for you. Good. Other thoughts about why is it that we think, automatically think that conflict is a negative thing? And where have we learned that? What in, what in society or in our lives have taught us, look, this is conflict and it is bad. And so we learned that conflict was bad. What kind of things taught us that? I think maybe if um, every people behaves positive, there will be no conflict. So if you have a conflict, so, so the reason and the consequence are a lot like that. If you, if you, behave negatively, there will be, there might be a, a, a conflict. But if you behave positively, there will be no conflict at all. So we can connect the conflict to negative emotions and behaviors. Right, right, that's really good. Thank you, thank you. Other thoughts, what has taught us that conflict is a bad thing? What has sent us those messages about conflict being bad? Um, I think that life is just messy. Mm. And, um, and we're, you know, constantly problem solving. And I think conflict comes from a lot of that or mm -hmm. leads to, to that messiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay, so in this, so this, this brings me to another question. So there is a lot of messiness in life. There is conflict in life. Would you say that your life has also been filled with places that you would learn healthy ways to navigate that messiness? Or have you kind of just been left to figure it out on your own most of your life without really being supported with skills and strategies around it? Which, which one would you all say? So I would say in a lot of uh, cases in the past, uh, I've been around people that try to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. So instead of engaging, expressing how they're feeling, they'll just, you know, either turn a blind eye or just avoid their own emotions about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's amazing. So if what you also see too is people avoiding it around you, there are no real examples of how to do it. Right, because everybody's going, yeah, ten foot pole, ten yeah. foot pole between me and that thing, right? And so if everybody's trying to stay away from it, you get we get good at what we practice. And so if what we practice is avoiding conflict, then that's what we get good at. If what we practice is escalating and just popping off without thinking, then that's what we're, right. And so and all of that reaffirms our belief in what we think conflict is. And I just want to interject that M Marty added that, you know, we're always seeing conflict on media and the television. Yep. <laughs> Big sizzle for Marty, right? I'm literally <laughs> just trying to avoid social media right now mm -hmm. because not only do people, like people get, uh, especially if it's somebody else's conflict, right? We got all the opinions. We uh, we we can we we assume what people's intentions were. We know exactly what they should and shouldn't have done. You know, until it's us, <laughs> and then we want all the forgiveness and compassion and understanding in the world. But it's because we automatically right the places we we see conflict play out, not just social media, but like the actual news. If the news is the place where you go to find out what's going on in the world outside of my door when I leave my house, you would just stay in the house because it, mm -hmm. there, there seems to be nothing good happening out there. You don't see news stories about how people had a disagreement and then they figured out how to work it out and came to a peaceful resolution. And here's the agreement. They, no, the agreement they came to was somebody was getting a bomb dropped on their country or somebody got shot or somebody got stabbed or there was, you know, some entity is going after another entity and some, you know, huge thing, right? So um, yeah, Steven, you got your hand up? I do. I didn't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. Um, I think that a lot of times we view conflict as, you know, between two people, but I think 
another big ass another big aspect of conflict can be internal so like if you use something and all of a sudden it makes you feel a certain type of way i think that's an internal conflict that kind of gets swept under the rug a little bit but it's real that's really good that's really good so and this is why like people say like just leave people alone because you never know what's going on inside of people right so yes if i'm struggling inside myself if i'm feeling like you know the me that i want to be my behaviors are disagreeing with the me that i want to be you know like that is a that's a that is an internal conflict and so somebody says or does the right or wrong thing that triggers something in me, right? Then some of what you're facing right now in the conflict between me and you is residue from internal struggles that I'm having as well, right? Um, so um, you can see, right, that a lot of times we do start at conflict itself, emotions that are connected with conflict, things that are connected with conflict, we kind of put over in the swamp monster box, right? That we just assume this is a negative, bad kind of thing that's happening. Um, so let me ask you all, um, is there anybody here, show of hands, who've never had conflict before? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so everybody's had conflict, right? So it's something that we're all doing. <laughs> And the way that it gets narrated to us, especially in a place like Baltimore, what kind of things, if you watch the news, what kind of things would you assume happen every time somebody has conflict in Baltimore? Unmute yourself and tell me, what kind of things would you assume happens? When there's conflict in Baltimore, what's gonna happen? You can say it, we know it's what y'all think. <laughs> Gonna shot. Somebody's yeah, gonna get shot. Pretty violent. Somebody, some violence is gonna happen, right? That you just, there's just like this, based in the way we're socialized, right? And so, but here we are, and all of us have had conflict before, um, and we're not running around shooting people every time somebody gets on our nerves. We, we're not. I mean, you know, if you have, God bless you. But you know, most of the time. <laughs> Right, that's not what people are having conflict all the time. And while absolutely things escalate to places that are devastating and horrifying sometimes, most people are not pulling out a gun or a knife every time they have a disagreement. Most people don't even punch somebody in the face every single time they are angry about something, right? So there must be other things that are also going on with conflict that were not as conditioned with or socialized with, right? And so a part of what happens is we get told that conflict is bad, bad, bad. And so however you view something going into it, that's what you automatically, you don't even get to see any of what else is there. And so let's, pay, let's, let's just start at the words we have already, right? The reason that we think conflict is negative is because we assume these things connected with conflict must be negative, right? So let's look at the words that we have. And can you tell me, are there words here that are not always negative? So unmute yourself and tell me any word on this list that's not always a bad or negative thing. Your heart rate could be accelerated for a number of positive things, like you have a baby, you know. That is right. So I'm going to circle accelerated heart rate because it does not mean that something horrible is happening necessarily. Good. What else on this list is not always a bad thing? Tears. Tears. Can you please... Uh, talk about that. How come tears is not always a bad thing? We can also cry because a good thing happened. Good. And even if bad things happen and we're crying, how come tears, how come crying and tears is not necessarily bad? It's like letting go of your emotions. Nice. 
Very good. Letting go and surrender. Here's here, here, here's a transparency moment. Um, so I have been having a really hard time sleeping lately. And so um, I have a friend who anytime there's anything going on with you physically, she goes and researches like from an energetic spiritual level, what is that thing a manifest, right? So basically she just, she, she'll drag you every time you see, because you'd be like, oh, that's why that's happening, right? So, okay, I wake up today. I'm like, oh, I can't sleep. What's the matter? So I go research insomnia and it says it's a fear of letting go, a fear of surrendering keeps you up at night that makes sense right if I'm holding on to everything I'm ruminating I'm worrying I'm you know I'm having I'm, I'm bad things that happen I'm just replaying them over and over and how much I'm victimized by these things and how people just don't get it and why won't they and right right and tears often comes with that so shedding and letting go you know is how we get to the next place is how we shift out a lot of times, right? So tears can be really good. What else on this list is not always a negative thing? Say being uncomfortable, it's not always negative. Being uncomfortable is not always negative. Can you say a little bit more about that, please? So um, nowadays, a lot of people say that to learn to grow as a person, it's best to get out of your comfort zone. And getting out of your comfort zone means that you're being uncomfortable. And through that, mm -hmm. you're learning and you're growing. Good, good. Yes, very good. Thank you for that. In this work, we often talk about how it is when we are uncomfortable that we really find out what we believe, right? So you can say what your values are, you can say, you know, what you believe in. And as long as nothing, challenges it as long as everything is going the way you want you don't really have to prove the kind of integrity you would walk in or the kind of values you would really have right so it is when we are uncomfortable that we find out okay yeah now what am I actually gonna do right so you find out where you are on your journey even a lot of times when you're uncomfortable what else anything else on here not always a bad thing Um, in case people, I don't know if everyone's um, able to see their screen. So in case you're not, the words that are left uncircled are frustration, perceived consequences, angry, disbelief, confused, miscommunication, distress, condescending, and trivial. Are any of those words not always bad or not always negative? What do you think? So um, Marty says frustration. Mm -hmm. it it could be you have high expectations of yourself. Oh, nice. Very good. Thank you, Marty. What do we think about anger? This is the, this is the one. Is, ang is being angry or is anger always a bad thing? I think angry can help you to fight for your own rights, especially mm. for those people who have less confidence in their, confidence in their self. So if one people just step back when they have conflict, it may not be good for themselves and angry can give mm. them the emotion to fight back. Yes, I love it. I love it. I love it. It reminds me, I, I read somewhere that uh, it says that anger is the soul's way of saying no, thank you. Right. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Some things happen and your soul goes, yes, I want that. Give it to me more and more and more something else happens and you go, oh, no, that's what we're not doing, right? And so you need a way to be able to express your no, right? It might not be good for me to go along with what everybody else is thinking or doing right now, right? Um, and so I think that what happens in the narrative around anger is we attach anger with 
behaviors that we see ourselves and others do when we're angry, right? So we get to, and it really, to be real with you, you know, welcome to group therapy. But what that actually means is that we're unwilling to take responsibility for our actions. So it's easier to blame anger because we know, right? So never in the history of ever have people in a society where injustice was happening, right? Things never shifted toward justice because people were just content and happy and like, you know what? Yes, this is all good. It's when people say, no, enough is enough. That it's that energy of no, right? That the anger energy that changes things, right? That shifts things, even on a, a level of, of social justice, right? And so what happens is, I think, so for an example, let's say we were in person. No, let's say we still weren't in person. And I just, I was in a good mood yesterday. And I was like, you know what? I want when people come to this training tomorrow for everybody to have donuts and coffee. And so I'm gonna, you know, reach out to them and find out how I can arrange that to make sure that like, just some, you know, early breakfast snacks, lunch snacks get to people, right? Cause I'm in a good mood. So you all would have been really happy about that. And you would have been telling me, Erica, thank you. You're so nice. I would have taken credit for that. I would not have said the happiness made me do it, right? I just would have said, oh, you're welcome. So when we do things that we're proud of, we don't say that, we don't blame the emotion. We don't give the emotion credit. We don't give the mood we were in credit. We just say, yep, you're right, I'm good, right? <laughs> but later today, I got running around to do and I have to leave the house and I'm gonna be in traffic. And um, I have been known in the past to have little teeny bits of um, uh, road, I, I'll call it road anger now. I don't escalate to the place of rage anymore, but I get some road anger, right? And so I don't, you haven't, this is my hand. If, any, if you all can look at the screen, this is my hand. So I don't have your pointing finger. Um, and I only have one hand, right? Because this is, <laughs> that's my other appendage over there right so I only had one finger to point with right so if I point with my pointing finger I'm sending a very different message than you all would be sending with your pointing finger right because my pointing finger is your something else finger right so let's say I'm driving home today I get angry and I start pointing at people with my pointing finger when I retell that story I'm going to tell my friends, oh, this person in traffic made me so mad that I had to give them my finger. So let's just process that one statement for a minute. I have already in that one statement put myself two degrees of separation away from my behavior. They made me, so it was a person, right, their fault, so mad that, okay, and then it was my anger that came and grabbed me around the neck and made me have to give them my pointing finger, right? And so when I'm, when I'm, and, and so a lot of times that's what we do because we're not proud of our behavior when we're angry. We, we say, oh, there must be something wrong with anger. But the truth of the matter is anger is a natural emotion that not only are you gonna feel, you have to feel it. In order to have a full healthy human experience, you have to honor your no. You can't go around swallowing your no. You have to stand in your no sometimes. And anger is that energy that allows us to be able to do that. But if we're in our mind telling ourselves that anger is even a bad thing, then this is when we come up with judging ourselves around our own emotions. And so then the internal conflict is happening at the same time because I'm inside going, I shouldn't be this mad about that. I shouldn't have let this person get me this mad. It's not that the person got you that mad. It must be something that you would get mad about or else you wouldn't be mad. So self-love looks like the freedom to say, yes, this is something I'm angry about. Now, if you don't want to stay angry about it, then you would work on that thing. But we got to be honest about how we feel in a moment, right? But because we think all of this stuff is negative, then, then it starts to eat at the way we move through situations when we're angry. 
right? Or when we feel confused or when there's miscommunication. It, it means we move through it with swamp monster energy, right? So can you think of some words that are positive and you can connect them with conflict? So again, unmute yourself. Positive words that you can connect with conflict. Preservation. I'm sorry, say it again. I said resolution. Resolution. What else? I heard somebody else's voice. Uh, dialogue or communication. Yes, dialogue. Communication, good, what else? Realization, in a sense. Realization, yes. Yeah. Peace. Yes, and that's something. Empathy. Empathy, yes, empathy. And now you're starting to look at this list, right? And if we had time, we could probably come up with more positive words. But now just looking at your screen, this is still our picture of conflict, right? And so green is representing those what we feel like are negative energy words. Blue is representing more of the, well, wait a minute. It's not necessarily negative, but this might actually even be positive. So if you're looking at your picture of conflict right now, would you be able to say conflict is always negative? Yes or no? No. Nope. But would you be able to say it's always positive? No. So then we're left with, well, that's why we're having problems with conflict because we can't figure out what it is. Is it negative or is it positive? It's neither. It is a neutral energy, right? Because conflict just means opposing thoughts or views. That's it. Now, when we have opposing thoughts or views, we have choices. So if I disagree with Debbie, I can go drop a bomb on her country. Or I can open up communication, right? And work on understanding. So it, so it depends. So, so the conflict energy is going to show up. We're going to have differences of opinions. We're going to see things differently. You know, we can, we, we can even when something happens in somebody else's life, we're going to disagree about, you know, on all sides of what they should or shouldn't have done because we just see things differently. So the fact that we view things differently, it's not a good thing that we view things differently or a bad thing, but it is a thing. And so we get to decide what to do with it. So it's just like, for example, um, a hammer. Unmute yourself and tell me some things you can do with a hammer. Build something. You can build something. What else could you do with the hammer? That's the opposite of building things. <laughs> you can break something. You can break something like somebody's car window, right? So if the hammer got used to build the house or if the hammer got used to bust somebody's car window with it, we're not gonna look at the hammer and say bad hammer because it got used to bust the window. It wasn't the hammer's fault. The hammer was sitting there minding its business when somebody decided I'm gonna take this neutral, this thing that has some energy in it. If I pick it up, it could do some things, but I'm gonna decide what it's gonna do. Same thing with gasoline. There's a, some gas sitting right there. I can put it in my car or I can burn your house down for lying to me all the time. Either way, it's not the gas's fault. What I did with that neutral energy. Conflict is the same way. We've just been told that when conflict shows up, we're supposed to take it and bust somebody upside the head with it. Or we're supposed to take it and let's burn this whole thing down with it. Like that's what we've been taught happens. But in truth, conflict shows up and we can do, we can go in whichever direction with it that we want to. 
Now, our dilemma is, so when we started and I said, oh, what, what words come to your mind? And we got all the swamp monster words. That is not our fault, really, right? Because our dilemma is the way our minds are designed, whatever it is we think about something, that's what we experience, right? So if I, I'm going to, Jackson, since you've been participating with me, I'm just going to lie on you real quick just to, you know, make my points, okay? All right, good. So let's say that I believe conflict is negative. So what that means is whatever, if I think that it's negative, I'm probably going to go down that road. So to play it out for you, if I think conflict is a bad negative thing, and let's say while I was in this Zoom and I'm you know, talking to y'all, being all expressive with my appendages, and my nub entered the screen, I saw Jackson's face do something that I didn't like, that I'm thinking, oh, he must have seen my nub and had, what's going on with his face now just because he sees, right? So I got conflict with that. I don't like it. I think it's a bad thing. When I see Jackson make a face at my nub, what, do I, what, what am I automatically going to think about him if I think conflict is a bad thing? You think he's being judgmental. That's exactly right. I'm going to start thinking negative things about Jackson. And here's how you know that that's true. We literally name things in a negative light when it's something we don't like. So for example, where I come from in Baltimore, when somebody looks at you in a way you don't like, you say they must have an eye problem. <laughs> right? And so I would say, oh, Jackson is looking at me crazy. He must have an eye problem. So we name it something green with not having had no conversation with Jackson, I've already decided he has an eye problem, right? So if I think conflict is negative, I'm gonna automatically label it with something negative, which means I'm gonna go down the road of, if I think this is a bad thing, then what are the strategies that I should be using, right? So I'm probably gonna use those green strategies because I wanna win if this is a bad situation, right? And that's often what you see in conflict, everybody trying to win, right? And so I might address Jackson and say something like, well, you know, when, when I was moving my, you know, my arm and my hand around, your face did something. And so I just, and, and it, I felt kind of offended by it. So I just want to check in. Do we have a problem? Okay. Do we have a problem? Somebody tell me, what does that question feel like to you? What's the energy? <laughs> what kind of, somebody go, do we have a problem? What am I telling Jackson that I already think? Sounds like you have a problem. We got a problem. So no matter how Jackson answers this question, he's in trouble. Because if he says, no, we don't have a problem, I, he's a liar. If he says, we do have a problem, boom, now I have permission to go in and pop off, right? And so I'm going to be using, even the way I'm asking questions are not going to be that I'm trying to get understanding versions of questions. So we got to think about what kind of questions are we even asking people? Are we asking questions that's based on our assumptions of who they are and what they're doing and what their intentions were? Or are we asking questions from a place of curiosity, right? Because when I'm going down the, oh, Jackson was wrong road for looking at me that way, I'm gonna ask him, do we have a problem? Which is what we call a close-ended question. It already tells him, I think we have a, question, a, a problem. And so it's probably gonna make Jackson feel kind of defensive right or at least misunderstood or like what what are you not what do you do we have a problem right so let's say jackson gives me his blue which is his truth no we don't have a problem there was some stuff going on you know in the office that i'm in maybe my face did something right at that moment i don't know but it wasn't about you now we've already established that i think he's a liar if he says no right because <laughs> i got my green glasses on so even though he just handed me some blue the most I can see is perhaps some shade of turquoise, right? And so I don't fully believe him. I can't fully see his blue. And so I'm now taking his telling me, no, it's not about me. Well, okay, well, maybe you should do some mirror work or something, Jackson, so you can see how your face impacts, right? Now I got advice for him about what he should do. And I'm now leaving with that green energy 
And I'm going to go tell my other friends, Stephen and Debbie, how Jackson was looking at me crazy and talking about maybe he had, maybe he was looking at, I bet you if I nub him in his eye, I will fix his vision for him, right? And they're going, yup, absolutely. That's right, because he's always going to look right. And they're on my side, man. So imagine, and, and often we wonder, well, why are people still bringing up things that happened last week? Well, we didn't get what we needed on the inside of it because all we could see was the green. So I left with green energy because inside of it, I didn't get a chance to talk to Jackson the way that I would have wanted to. Debbie, your hand is up. Oop, sorry about that. I just want to let you know, it's 122. Seven We've minutes. got eight minutes left. Eight minutes now, left. If, okay. if you have time and want to go over a bit, that's fine with me. I don't know if the students will I'm be able be to stay. I'm going to try not to go over. I mean, okay. I'll stay on if people have questions, but I'm going to be trying not to go over. Right. But, and, okay. and just one other comment. Okay. When one thing that we see in the legal aid office is students that have conflicts with roommates. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. And so, so everything you automatically you're saying, yeah. yeah, everything you're saying now just totally yeah. jives with and, that. And that intensifies kind of the longer you've known the person, right? Because you already, if you know them, you're like, oh, here we go with it. Like you don't, it doesn't occur to you that maybe they mean something a little bit different than what they normally mean when they say this thing. Like we just, we automatically assume. So imagine now if I think conflict is blue. So that means in my mind, when conflict shows up, it's an opportunity for dialogue and realization and empathy and communication, right? And now even the things that were green, like my own anger, because I think conflict is blue, I still feel the discomfort of the green anger energy on the inside, right? But it's covered with blue. So now even my own anger is a trigger for me. Oh, this is an opportunity for these other things to happen, right? So now Jackson looks at me. I think he's looking at me because of my nub. I don't like it. I'm still angry. I still feel offended. But now I want to build understanding. I want communication. And I believe this is an opportunity for that. So it will dawn on me to ask questions that will build that understanding and open up that communication. So do we have a problem? Is a shutdown communication kind of, kind of question. But me still being honest, hey, Jackson, I noticed that when my nub made an appearance on the screen, your face did something. I felt kind of offended by it. But I wanted to check in with you, like what was going on for you while, while I was doing the workshop, right? So just taking those two questions, do we have a problem and what was going on for you? They feel like very different questions because they have yeah. very different energy behind them. Right. So what was going on for you tells Jackson, I know something was going on, but I'm not going to lay my assumption on him about what was going on. I'm interested in him telling me and speaking for himself so that I can better understand him. So often people say, but Erica, what if you're trying to be blue and people just want to be green? It's still up to you. Because if Jackson says, well, Erica, I did see your nub and I was wondering, well, how does she tie her shoes? And does she put her own clothes on? And does she have kids? Like, how is she, right? Now you're like, Jackson, no, what are you saying? That's crazy, right? Okay, so Jackson would have put gasoline in front of me. And it's still up to me to decide, am I using that gasoline in my car? And go, well, you know, I can see how you two-handed people might think <laughs> That being one-handed is just so way more difficult. I get it. And so I'll explain, I, oh, you know, I learned how to tie my shoes at three. And yeah, I got three grown children and grandbabies. And they all turned out pretty good. You know, no, everybody survived the nub, right? So we can have a certain kind of conversation that opens up communication. Or when he puts that gasoline in front of me, I can say, what you mean? Can I tie my shoe? And I can go off on him and light a match to that gasoline. So it's still always up. It's still always up to you. Now, do you think that the next time you have conflict, you're going to go, oh, what a wonderful opportunity for growth and understanding. Do you think you're going to do that? <laughs> you might not. It might take you a minute, right? But what I do want you to think about is really just think about what I perceive I create. What I believe, right? Because life really is make-believe. 
Whatever we believe in, we make that thing. And then when we make that thing, we see it outside of ourselves, which makes us believe in it more. And so around conflict and violence, right? We believe in the power of violence. We believe in the power of winning. Oh, we believe in the power of, you know, power over instead of power with one another. Those are the energies that we nurture, right? So what would happen if in your own individual self, you said, okay, somebody's getting on my nerves right now. Do I want to put it in my car or do I want to light a match to it? You know what I mean? Do I want, what do I want to do with this energy? Questions, comments, aha moments. I gotta stop share so I can see everybody. Oh, look at that, confused, annoyed, anger. Oh yeah, okay, see I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do have something. So yes. um, the second type of conflict that we see at Legal Aid is when a student is having an issue with, like a graduate student is having an issue with their supervisor. Yeah. yeah. So it's this, yeah. it's a situation where they're not really on a level playing field. And yeah. so- When there's a power imbalance. They, exactly. Then all kinds of other yes. things. In there. Yeah. So what I wanna say as well is, um, you know, the Community Mediation Center in Baltimore is a free service that people can use. So those, you know, roommate disputes, the, you know, even in the power imbalance, parent, child, employer, employee, landlord, tenant, we do all of those kinds um, because people are still people, whether they, you know, whatever your perceived or real power is in a situation, your feelings can get hurt too. You can feel misunderstood too. You can feel mischaracterized, too, you know? And so people need a safe space to have that conversation. And so we provide free mediation services. A mediation is a two hour meeting for you to sit down and say, you know, really what's going on. Um, and mediators run a process that if you want to leads to concrete agreements about what you and I are gonna do moving forward. But you can absolutely see in all, especially the more personal, right, the, the, the conflicts are, it's a lot easier to slide into the, oh, this must be something to avoid or escalate. And those are my two choices, right? So we want to give yourself the freedom and permission to explore what is, what's the difference between curiosity instead of assumption, right? And how can I ask those kind of questions um, instead? Yay! Does anybody else have a question or a comment or an aha? <laughs> and if you are interested, so that what I did with you all today was a, like an introduction to conflict management. We can do a whole bunch of different kind of training with listening skills and practices where you can vent at each other and then practice. I'm working on understanding this crazy thing you just now said, right? Um, and so if you are at an organization that would like us to do a presentation about, you know, just mediation services or conflict management skills, or if you like, you know, you got some of it today, if you like more, please um, reach out to the Baltimore Community Mediation Center. All right, I, I will share your contact information in the- Yay, thank you so <laughs> much. And the follow-up email. Wow, this was really cool. It was so fun to have a really um, dynamic speaker. You were so engaging, um, really got Yay. me thinking, and I think everyone else would agree with that. So thank you so much, Erica. Yay, thank you all for spending part of your afternoon with me. Yeah, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. And if you didn't turn on your camera, that's okay. But thank you to those who were brave enough to do that. So um, we have thank two more all. workshops with the series on April 5th, next Tuesday, help me start my own business. And on April 12th, last workshop of the semester is help me negotiate my salary. So oh. yeah, good stuff. So everyone have a great week. And as always, let us know how legal aid can help you. Yay. Take care. Thank you.